Let's start. I think thank you very much. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining us. Um, I think we really are very grateful to our guests um, who are providing us some insight into what's going on in, uh, um, in Uganda. I think that's a, uh, um, an important space in our, in our country, in our continent. Um, I want to introduce Innocent Basidja and he'll be chairing the meeting. Um, we have this weekly webinar um, as a joint effort between uh, Wonka Africa, WHO and Afro PHC. And I'm very glad to hand over to Innocent Basidje, who has been very key in that movement around Afro PHC and this webinar. Um, he's a family physician in Uganda. Um, he's going to tell you more about himself and our guests. I hand over to you, Innocent. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Shabil, and uh, welcome to all our listeners uh, this afternoon, this morning, uh, this evening, and some in the night. Um, we are happy that finally we are here, and if I will introduction, um, I am called Innocent Besige. I'm a family physician, and I work at Makere University uh, in the Department of Family Medicine as a lecturer. But I've also been closely working with the Professor Shabir, who is the, the Wonka Africa president, uh, in trying to stimulate uh, and create momentum for PHC on the African continent under the forum of Afro PHC. Uh, I also, I'm also an executive member of the Prima Family Network, which is a network of academic departments of family medicine in Sub-Saharan Africa and the countries. Uh, and it's also important to note that Prima Farmed is the official academic wing of Wonka Africa. Uh, and this afternoon here in Uganda, I will be uh, doing this discussion with my two other colleagues, uh, Dr. Michael Murawaza, who is a, uh, a family physician and has experience of more than a decade of being the head of the community health department in the regional referral hospitals. And currently, he is the, he is the head of the community health department at Jinja Regional Referral Hospital, one of the big provincial hospitals in the eastern part of Uganda. And he, will, he has been at the forefront uh, of the fight against COVID, leading a team of, of health professionals and health workers within his, his catchment area. So he will be sharing with us uh, his experience at the front line uh, of, of fighting the COVID pandemic. And we also have uh, with us uh, Dr. Samuel Okori, who is the medical superintendent of Abel Hospital in Lira, a private uh, not-for-profit. And we recognize the importance, uh, the, the important contribution uh, of this non, uh, uh, the, 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 the non-governmental health facilities in the fight against this epidemic. Uh, so he will be sharing with us uh, what, he, what he has been doing in a non-governmental uh, non, uh, non facility uh, as far as the, 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 the fight against the pandemic is concerned. So and his main area of discussion um, will be the, 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 the lessons learned as a not-for-profit facility and also what he thinks should have been done better for the involvement uh, of these not-for-profit uh, health facilities. Uh, and I think, uh, of course, they will add on part of, the, uh, of whatever I may have missed in introducing them when they start on their brief presentations. I think without um, uh, wasting much time, we really needed to go into the, 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 the actual presentation uh, so that we are able to, we, we are able to catch up with the time. Um, So um, briefly, I will just take you through what has been happening as far as uh, COVID-19 pandemic in Uganda is concerned. Um, as of today morning, we, we have a total number of 300 
and 17 confirmed cases. Uh, the good news is that most of these cases are actually asymptomatic. They don't have symptoms, but most of the, uh, almost all, I mean, all of the cases are actually have been man isolated and managed within the hospital. Uh, we, we, so far, since the, 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 the first case of COVID-19 was discovered, was first confirmed in Uganda, I think on the, uh, on the 21st of March, I guess. Um, so far, we have had 69 recoveries. Uh, it is important to note that um, most of these cases, a significant contribution is from the uh, uh, trailer drivers or trucker drivers. And I think uh, when these are diagnosed, uh, most of them uh, return to their countries where they receive care. And it is also important to note that we, so we, as of now, we have not registered any deaths at all. So the number of deaths is still at zero. And when I cross-checked this morning, as of yesterday evening, a total of, of 93,260 tests have been done. Of course, we are aware that there is a limitation uh, on, the, on the testing capability, but that's what I've managed to do for the last two, two months. Uh, it is important that when the first case was, was confirmed, even before, um, the country uh, under the stewardship of the Ugandan Minister of Health uh, made some preparations. Uh, and what happened was um, the, the call centers were established uh, with the telephone hotlines where the people who had any concern uh, were, would call. Uh, probably if you suspect uh, anybody from having COVID symptoms, either from the health facilities or from the communities, the, the numbers were, were, were given out and the people managed the centers. However, I, I think in the, in the first days, the, the congestion was too much and the people were calling in every other time. But I think as of, uh, with, with the time, uh, the management became better. And at the same time, uh, the health workers were being trained uh, to make sure that the, the, there is readiness First of all, to be able to, 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 to trace the contacts, but also to, to do case management. And uh, the other thing that was done in the early stages of the epidemic was the establishment of quarantine centers where, most of, where the suspects were quarantined. And I, uh, uh, in the beginning uh, days, everyone who came in from abroad, because the first case was actually of a traveler from Dubai, we are quarantined for 14 days in these different centers. But of course, this was quite challenging because quarantine was not a common practice in our country. So the beginning was also quite difficult because people didn't know the best model of quarantine that, that should have been followed. Uh, the other challenging issue was that we had only one testing center. So all of the samples would be collected and then uh, sent to the Uganda Virus Research Institute which was the only established center for radio time of PCR that was the only confirmatory test for, for testing COVID-19. Uh, and it is important to note that the training of the health workers predominantly uh, focused on, 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 on the laboratory personnel. Uh, of course, we are aware that it was quite difficult logistically to be able to train the primary care providers given the large numbers. And then when, when the first case was confirmed, then um, the country went into lockdown, like um, other countries have done. Uh, but it is important to note that the lockdown was not abrupt. It was done in phases. And um, we, 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 first they, they stopped the, the, the public gatherings, the schools closed down, the areas of prayer like churches, mosques, and, and, and then uh, shopping arcades. Then when the case was confirmed, then the other phases of the record that came in, with the major one being the suspension of public transport, but also the suspension of movement of private cars for the non-essential workers. But when the record was affected, other things happened. Uh, for example, we had the difficulty in maintaining the essential health services. Uh, most of the people given our social economic status and handed to mouse survivors. So it became so hard. And uh, 
even restricting the movement uh, uh, became difficult because of the nature of the way our people live. For example, when you look at that picture, it is a, a picture of the Uganda army, the Uganda People's Defense Forces distributing food. Uh, you, 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 you would notice, for example, that that lady being given the food, when you look at that place where she stays, it is not very easy to do social distancing. It is not very easy to stay in, at, at, within the house because of the nature of their living conditions. Now, these people are the, who were living hand to mouth when the lockdown was, was effectively put into, in, into, into, into place, they had difficulty surviving. That's why the government came in and started distributing food. So uh, as a way of trying to make sure that people stay home, otherwise it was becoming difficult uh, for, for, for them to survive. But you notice that the living conditions are really not very conducive uh, for some of these uh, of, of the lockdown implications that happen in the population. What you also noticed is that the social distancing was not very easy for most people, and I think everyone is almost agreeing that social distancing is for the privileged few. That picture was taken from one of the villages where they were distributing the food to the vulnerable people. You will notice that we are encouraging social distancing but people are congregating around the person distributing the food within the community. Uh, which, the, which means that actually, even the activities that are being uh, done to, to prevent COVID-19 may actually end up posing risk as well. So, and where are we now? Uh, of course, it was difficult for the country to continue effecting the, the lockdown. So we are in the phases of lifting up again. Um, one of the things that has happened uh, is that first, the, the, the private cars are now back on the road. Uh, some of the essential businesses are back, but the, uh, the, the, the conge areas of congestion like in the churches and the schools are still, under, under, uh, are still closed. And we are also continuing to do surveillance to look for the contacts and other people at risk. Uh, there's also going contact tracing and of course case management for those who test positive. It is important to note that, uh, as, as I said before, that most of the cases are from trucker drivers. Focus now is on the border districts to make sure that active surveillance on the border districts is done so that we try to, to limit the entry of cases from other uh, parts of, of East Africa. Now, it is important to note that when the lockdown was open, that picture was taken in downtown Kampala three days ago and it appeared in the newspapers. Uh, you will notice some uh, of when the president said we can start lifting up the lockdown, he, he emphasized several times that we must have mandatory mask wearing. Now you can see the people downtown Kampala, they are, most of them are wearing the masks on the chins and even the congestion. So, short, so we really have a big task ahead in trying to effectively control this epidemic. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think now I will hand over to, to uh, uh, Dr. Michael to be able to, to share um, he, to, to, to share his experiences of being on the front line of uh, fighting against COVID. Thank you. So, Dr. Michael, you need to unmute. Yes, Dr. Innocent, can you hear me? Yes, please. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we are hearing you well. Thank you so much Yeah, for those introductions. Just uh, to, I'm Dr. Michael Mloza. I work in Ginger General Referral Hospital, one of the provincial hospitals in uh, Uganda. And I'm here to share with you my role that I've played during this COVID outbreak in the country. Next slide. Yes. So like I've said, I work in the community health department and part of my work involves responding to outbreaks within the region. I work within 
the regional referral hospital, but I also support around 12 districts that fall under the catchment area. So uh, during this role, we work under the guidance of the Minister of Health. Minister of Health guides us in terms of policy, in terms of guidelines, it provides us with supplies and logistics. It, it actually also set us off with some funds. And above all, it maintains a technical support to the team here that is working on the COVID response. We've done a, a, a bit of work with the districts in the response. And part of the work involves work around infection prevention and control. Next slide. And in this area of supporting districts in infection prevention and control, we've participated in the in training of health workers on how to don this personal protective equipment. We've had to teach health workers at all levels, from hospitals and lower health centers, about how to utilize these PPEs. Because the point is, if they, are, they have the personal protective equipment, they get the the interest, not only the interest, but also the confidence to see these cases. We also work very closely with the districts to pile the PPEs in strategic areas such that we always have reliable stocks. Another area where I've worked with the districts is in the area of surveillance. We assist districts in the completion of the case investigation forms, and also in the area of coming up with the contact lists. We do this both at the hospital level and also even at the community level. And in addition to this, we train focal people who will focus on surveillance within the districts. In the area of case management, especially at the regional referral hospital, we've set up a screening site and a triage site at the hospital. Um, currently, we have about 11 confirmed cases. Like Dr. Innocent put it, the majority of these are symptomatic. Only two have symptoms, and these are basically flu and, and cough. In the coordination role, we've done some work with the districts where we coordinate trainings, we coordinate delivery of items, and also we coordinate work related to, to any form of trainings within the region, supply of materials, and also any communication between the national level and the district. I'll just give you a snapshot about the cases that we have in isolation. I'll start, in total, we have about 11 cases. The majority of these are between the 20 to 30 year age group. A few are within the 30 to 40 year age group. And then we also have cases in the 40 to 50 year age group. We don't have cases that are older than 50 years, possibly due to the fact that the majority of cases that we have seen are still actively involved in productive work. By occupation, the majority of these cases are transporters. We also, we have seen cases that have come from a local factory, a local factory in one of the districts. So this, because it's a factory, transporters deliver items and pick items from that factory. In the end, what has happened is that anyone who interacts with these transporters is at risk of contracting the disease. That's why we have the security officers who receive them at the factory, and then the administrators who handle some paperwork and probably registration forms. Next slide, Next slide please. Yeah. We've faced some challenges, and these challenges have changed over, over time. Um, but currently, we are facing an issue which is related to the burnout of health workers. As the cases keep increasing, we notice that we need different sets of health workers, and we need to support these health workers to cope with the, the, the burden. 
And it's also resource intensive to maintain an isolation section and a quarantine section. You need manpower, you need funds for feeding, you need to dress these people, you also need to provide bedding so it can be resource intensive to our health system. One lesson learned is that you need to have multiple response teams in a hospital. When you have multiple response teams, you are able to change them when necessity arises, and you're also able to pass on skills such that there's continuity of services. Thank you so much. That's what I can share about my experience. Uh, but you, thank you. you know, Innocent, you're not mute, you're still muted. Dr. Sam, are you there? Sam. You, you can't hear me? I think he... Hello, Dr. Sam, can you hear us? Are you able to hear us? Yes. Okay, so you can start. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, as Dr. Besige has already introduced me, I'm uh, Dr. Samuel Okori. I'm the medical director at Bear Hospital. A Bear Hospital is in northern Uganda. It's in, uh, it's in Kambini, near Kambini. Kambini is very famous uh, because uh, it's, it's a border post uh, where the Uganda Revenue Authority has intercepted many truck drivers who have been found positive at the border of Lego in uh, Sudan and Malaba and Busia and Kenya, Uganda border. So I'd like to share with you the, how we are coping up or responding to the uh, COVID-19. First of all, we are a private not-for-profit hospital. Private not-for-profit means that we actually don't, don't work for profit. We, we need money, yes, to meet the cost of services. But if there is any surplus at all, it is not distributed or shared by owners. It is actually uh, recirculated back into development to improve services and maybe to expand the infrastructure required for services. So the, the contribution of private not-for-profit facilities or hospitals in Uganda has been and is very enormous because about, uh, I would say over 55% of the health service delivery in the country is provided by the private not-for-profit. And that is a very huge contribution of the private not-for-profit in the country. And also about 60% of the nurses in Uganda are trained by the private not-for-profit training schools in the country. That is a huge contribution. And about one third of the workforce serving in the country are actually uh, uh, from the private not-for-profit uh, uh, facilities. And a lot of contribution in terms of infrastructure, infrastructure, human resource for health and human resource development is actually from the private not-for-profit. And 
much as we need money, there is a, a flat fee. There is a cost sharing, I would say, for maternal and child health. For example, in this hospital, a better hospital, a uh, resident section for mothers, uh, including admission, treatment, and investigation is 38,000. That is less than 10 US dollars, 38,000. And children under five years old is 17,000. That is almost seven US dollars. And this is uh, for even if the child stays for one month or two months is 17,000. So the contribution and the role of private not-for-profit facilities in Uganda cannot be underestimated and cannot be ignored. Now, when the COVID, uh, when this pandemic struck us and is still with us, definitely was announced by government that uh, I think it's very clear, everybody knows that government has banned private hospitals from treating COVID patients. As the, as the steps are to centralize treatment at all regional referral hospitals, as you have heard Dr. Michael was explaining to us. So uh, treatment or case management is at, at regional referral hospitals. And so what are we doing? For us as a hospital, at the very beginning, we set up, even before government came up with uh, all this, we actually, because one of the first suspects actually was from this hospital. Uh, the, the couple had returned from Kenya just a few days when they announced the lockdown. Before the lockdown, actually, they, they returned from Ke Kenya and we were the first people to go and, took, uh, and, and take this sample. It was uh, about maybe 10 kilometers from the hospital. So we took the sample and we had to bring we had to, to evacuate the suspects from their homes to the, to the quarantine site here in the hospital because of fear. The village people wanted to kill them. So we had to evacuate them and we kept them here for two days waiting for the results from, uh, from Entebbe. Then after that, we took them back to their, to their homes and we had to talk to the people that, okay, they are, they are negative, so do not kill them, don't do anything to them. Then after that now, a lot of people started following the case and uh, the, the, the taking, uh, taking of samples and reporting every day from the ministry, yes. But for us in the hospital, we, we set up, we set up a, a quarantine center on our own. We, we set up a surveillance uh, a screening point at the gate, a triage, where we have the temperature gun, uh, infrared, and uh, we, we, we have a, a, a shelter, uh, a tent, where the, all patients, clients, and attendants, visitors, they have to pass there and have their temperature checked. And if they have a, a temperature, we go ahead and check for malaria. If there's no malaria, we go ahead and ask for their travel history. Have they traveled somewhere else? Have they uh, been in contact with anyone or truck drivers? So that is what we are doing up to now. But well, just to mention that uh, we, the, the, the staff here are trained in managing Ebola about uh, a year ago. So we have the knowledge to manage, I would say, <laughs> pandemic. So I would say that. So we are able to, we know how to don, we know how to, to do all these things uh, with the PPEs. So at the gate, we have a hand washing facility, which is foot operated. You don't have to touch the, the, the ando or the tap for the water, just step on the, on the pedal and the water comes, the soap and you wash your hands and then you proceed to check your temperature. Now, uh, since it was announced that uh, private facilities or private not-for-profit will not be able to, will not treat 
with patients, yes, we said that is okay, but we, for us, we continue to do surveillance, institutional surveillance that we do actually every day, even right now, as I talk, up to 5 p.m., we have our staff who are rotating to, to make sure everyone coming to the facility are screened, are screened, and, and some questionnaire have been, uh, checklist has been set so that they, you, you ask some few questions just to make sure uh, we don't have uh, uh, a, a suspect or if there's a, a suspect, you can quarantine and, and you take the sample and you send the sample. Now, you are aware that the district hospitals or general hospitals are not to treat. The treatment is at general refer uh, regional referrals, which is fine. But when we met the minister uh, last week in the district headquarters, uh, this question was raised to her. And she said that uh, district hospitals or private not for profit profit or private facilities are not supposed to treat uh, COVID patients. But there are some large volume hospitals like Lacho. They are just like uh, regional referrals and they have the capacity to, to treat like Rubaga, like uh, Nsambia. Those ones could be in a position to actually treat and maybe even much better. But our reasoning of the minister is that they want to contain in one place, which makes sense, that you don't have to, to spread the treatment of COVID uh, patients all over. Now, I still think that the, the private not-for-profit facilities have been kind of left out in the sense that they could have, we could have been facilitated to set up a quarantine center to provide, uh, we got some, PPEs from national medical stores, but these were just very few, and they are finished, they are out of stock, and we have not received any. Now, in case we have a suspect that is in quarantine and needs to be evacuated, what shall we do? So that's the challenge. So I feel that we have been left out, yet we contribute uh, a, a, a big percentage of the service delivery to to, to the people in this country. So moving forward, I think that while we have missed opportunities, the government also has missed the opportunity to incorporate and to work together with the private not-for-profit facilities. The way forward is that the government should adopt and practice actually a multi-sectoral approach to handling pandemic because maybe five years or 10 years, we will have something like this again. Supposing the pandemic, supposing COVID-19 becomes everywhere, what shall be done? Will the regional referrals be able to handle everything? So that is the, that is the kind of thing I'm talking about. And then the L system strengthening. This is the time to work on those areas that needs to be in place, not to wait for another pandemic and you begin to, to, to work on these places. We were, we were told that all regional referrals were ready, but in actual fact, they were not ready. So we should emphasize health system strengthening. I like to talk about risk communication. This virus is going to be with us for a long time. We need to communicate clearly to the people, to our communities, that there is a problem, there's a, 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 there's a disease, there's a virus that needs us to be aware of. Social distancing is a very big problem. People are just, see, yesterday I was going to Lira, people are just sitting, drinking marua together. Just see no sense completely of social distancing. We are supposed to put on masks. There are those who don't like to put on masks. They say it is, uh, it, they feel like suffocating. They feel like dying. So these are the kind of things that we should communicate. There are risks. This is risk communication to our population. Then the psychosocial support is another point. There's a lot of stigma. 
anyone who is COVID-19 positive, they want to kill them. They want to send them away. So we need to communicate this to our people that this disease is going to be with us for a long time. We don't have to send our relatives or people we know who are COVID positive away. And they have stigma, they fear. So they, they, this, they need psychosocial support for themselves, but also for the, for the community. Lastly, I think this is a time for us as a country to get onto research, get onto research because I have heard the protocols which are being worked on, yes. This protocol should help us not to prepare us. I'm almost sure that there's going to be another epidemic at some point in some form. So we just have to be ready in preparing uh, uh, with the L system, strengthening, building systems in place and then also to be able to carry out research. So this is what I can say as we go ahead in the fight and response uh, against COVID. Thank you. Uh, thank you um, very much, Dr. Sam. Um, and uh, to all of the attendees, I'm sure uh, what has been shared, there are important things to discuss. Um, but I think, First and foremost, I would, I would like us to respond. We have two questions. And um, the first question, which I would actually ask you people who have been at the front line, is that uh, the case presentation in some other countries, particularly the Western countries, has been different from what happens here in our country. For example, hypothetically, if the, the, the fatality rate of the disease is 2%. By the time we have 300 cases, we should at least have had three, four people die, but no one has died in Uganda. So the question is, what would explain that? Do you think there may be some subtypes of the virus such that by the time the virus arrived in Uganda, it had undergone some mutation and the virulence is, low, is lower than what it was in those other countries? Perhaps, Michael, you want to respond to that? Yes, I would like to say it is also a surprise to us. We are surprised that uh, the majority of cases are symptomatic. It is a very interesting scenario where you present results to someone and he says, I have no complaint. And when you try to ask for a recall and uh, you ask if they have had problems or any symptoms within the previous two to three weeks, it's the same story, no symptoms. Apart from a few who say, probably I got a mild upper respiratory tract infection and I improved without treatment. I think that's what we are seeing. It's a bit of a surprise to us. Um, from newspaper reports and a few comments from some experts here and there, we've had some say that probably there could be a mutation and we anxiously wait for any scientific analysis and response to that. Is there, is, that the, is there capacity, if I may ask, uh, Innocent, if you don't mind, um, no problem. asking about whether there's testing capacity in Uganda um, at the subtypes? Do you, are you able to do that? To actually compare subtypes in Uganda to what's going on in other parts of the world? Do you know no, about I... the testing ability? Maybe, uh, Innocent, you know um... what is capable. Yes, I, as, as I actually said in my presentation, we only have one testing center and all yeah. that is done is to do the, uh, the real-time PCR. So we don't have the capacity to do the subtyping. Yeah. And that has been the question. People are saying we need to actually do the, the, the genetic sequencing of yeah. the virus that is infecting Ugandans. But of course, the capacity is quite limited, so we are not able to do subtypes. Well, I think Aisha Tevi is from the WHO, although she's in Geneva, um, but it would be an interesting question to see if, if WHO has, you know, is looking at this question of um, subtypes across the world to see if, in fact, we are having different subtypes where there's mutations and that might explain something of this, of this apparent virulence shift. But I must confess, uh, in South Africa, we also had the same idea 
we thought, oh, this looks like a not very virulent, um, you know, um, virus. Uh, it's a bit deceptive when your numbers are, case numbers are less than a thousand. But as it's crept up, uh, the, the case fatality has hovered around two and a half percent. And in fact, I think we are looking at even the number of admissions being almost 15, 10 to 15 percent. So it's not a small number as you go forward. So just be careful. It's, it might be an initial stage. Um, I do want to ask the question, and it would be two things popped up in my mind. I think there's another question, but if I can just add this to this discussion here at this point, Innocent. Um, what, what I was wondering about is in some places, um, the deaths, unexplained deaths, rise in unexplained deaths has almost become a, 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 um, an indicator of COVID-related deaths. And in Kano that popped up where the number of cases being picked up and the death rate of people identified as having COVID was not very high. But people in the community said, we are now burying 10 times more people uh, as compared to last year. And, but there's no testing capacity to say, is that COVID related? Are you seeing changes of deaths? Is there a, some sort of way in which you can review death rates uh, across the country to be able to pick up a comparison to the previous years and notice if there's an increase in death rate? All cause death rate. Are you innocent if you can answer that to the other colleagues? No, I. Oh, yeah. Please, Sam, go on. Yes, uh, I, I would think that uh, we are still at a very initial stage to even say that uh, this virus is not fatal or will not kill people. We still have about 317. I think by the time we reach 1,000 or 2,000, we'll begin to see a shift towards uh, the people dying. Yeah. Uh, we have informed the community here that whenever you hear somebody has died, please report because it might be due to COVID or something else. But largely it seems like the, the, the death from non-COVID uh, causes are actually on the increase as opposed to real COVID for those who have been tested positive. Maybe we don't yet know uh, whether people are dying in the villages, but we have passed the message on registrations and we have informed them to inform the authority, inform the district that we have seen this person die. He was like this and so that something can be done, maybe autopsy or something yeah. can be done. Be otherwise, Even, we, cannot, yeah. Yeah, we cannot just be there and say, oh, uh, yeah. uh, you know, th there are some theories that they, they kept saying that, oh, uh, we have some endemic coronavirus, but we just don't know oh. it. I don't know. Yeah. But we cannot yeah. be complacent now. We have to take this very seriously. By the time we reach yeah. 2,000 or 1,000, because we are going very fast. Now it's 317. Next week might be 400 or 500. Yeah. It's so right now we cannot really say, oh, we are, uh, we are lucky. No, we can't even say that because it's too early to me. True. But I think what you're saying is that uh, registrations in itself is a challenge. So you don't have stats to actually look at for starters. So that is a beginning problem. You need to get deaths registered and then look at deaths caused yes. compared yes. to previous years. So I, I think that right. makes it quite challenging to actually look at past history and see if the death rates increase. Michael, right. I'm not sure whether, you know, perhaps I'll raise this other question and you can respond to both of them. I'm curious about the imported, uh, you know, truck drivers that you talked about, Innocent, versus community transmission. I got the impression that you'll al already have community transmission. So the imported cases have more or less been nipped in the bud, so to say. But now the cases popping up are actually from within the community and from spread within the community without a travel history, without a sort of uh, truck driver encounter. Perhaps you can just clarify that. So Dr. Michael, would you uh, say? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. whichever. Yeah. Michael? Yes, I would say that it has been an experience 
in, in yes. initially can you hear me yes yes we can hear you thanks yeah initially we were seeing transporters mostly coming in from neighboring countries uh, we are nearer the kenya border and where i work but like i said we've got cases that are linked to one of the transporters so we believe it's a kind of community transmission and it has kick-started a lot of efforts to trace contacts here within that district. We are in consultation with the center to find out what more we can do. Um, we have intensified surveillance and there's also a shift or an effort to try to prepare districts to set up isolation centers to strengthen surveillance teams within the lower levels from, the, from what we have seen. When we saw those cases, I think it was a wake up call for us to focus a lot more about surveillance at the lower levels. So if I may so just pick up, yeah, go ahead, Innocent, sorry. Yeah, so I, I, I think we are just in the early phases of community transmission. Mm, yeah, yeah. So I there's would evidence, say so. evidence already. So my curious question is, in fact, you've mentioned it just now, that you are looking at surveillance. Um, are you yes. doing community surveillance? My question would be is that, are you doing at primary care facilities any sort of triaging? In other words, when people are walking in for the ailments at a clinic or a health post, are healthcare workers at the gate asking questions like, do you have symptoms? And if you are, that you are actually managed separately from the rest of those who are without symptoms. Are you doing that at a very local yes. level? Yes, so, we are doing that. At least at the regional referral hospital, we have trained teams that are manning the screening unit and also the triage area. Yeah. And no, we identify... The, we, yes. you, you mentioned it's a regional hospital. My, curious, my concern is about the clinic, the small thing down there in the community. That's the health post. Yes, and clinic. that is what we are rolling out. Right. We are rolling it out to the district hospitals and also to the lower health facilities. Right. We've designated teams at those areas and we've tasked them to set up screening areas and also triage areas outside the buildings. Right. We've tried to show the health workers that it's quite important in order for us to identify these cases early and also to protect the other health workers. We are also in advanced steps. We have some community health workers, but we need to work with them in a more organized way. We want them to be our listening posts in the villages. We want to arrange them in such a way that they can call a district surveillance focal person and, uh, and alert them in case they have somebody whom they suspect to have COVID-19. Yeah. Yeah, okay. so it's a process. We are now moving more towards the lower levels. Yeah. Uh, may I? May yeah, I? Go ahead, I, go ahead, Sam. Yes. Uh, my, I think we should not just be uh, rolling out the surveillance at this time. We should have done it long time ago, because it is actually getting very late. Be True. What I know is that for us at the at the district, uh, I mean the district or general uh, general hospital, we are doing surveillance at the gate every day, even in, right, right now as I speak, there are health workers who are doing surveillance, as I mentioned already in my, in, in my mm, presentation, yes. they're doing surveillance. But also at the health center threes, they also have the temperature gun in, the, in this district, as far as I'm aware. And there is uh, village surveillance. How? How is it being done? They are mainly with uh, contacts contacts of the truck drivers, that's what they're doing for now. But mm -hmm. we need to do more than just that, more than contacts. And that is the challenge. Yeah. If, uh, let's say two months from now or three months and the virus becomes widespread, we, we won't know where to go and where to turn. Yeah. So that is a challenge. And also, uh, like, I, like I said, risk communication should be really, really very clear, clearly spelled out to the population that there's their risk. So 
Social distancing is very important, but to our, to, we are not even surprised that people are just walking without caring about that. And mm -hmm. that is very risky. So that's the big challenge. Yeah. So Sam, I think you, you're raising an important point. I think that how much is it happening? What's the readiness, not just in the hospitals Correct. and at high level, but in the community and at Correct. small facility level? And I yes. think that, you know, you're raising that question, and which is really important for us. And for, as family physicians, we've been very concerned about that difficulty you've pointed out. One of the things that we've uh, said, let's try to do at the front gate um, is, is screening questions. And we've been battling with, I think, the same difficulty you have um, in the country as to how much of testing capacity you have. I think you're going to have a bigger difficulty than we have in South Africa. And yet we have a difficulty in South Africa. Um, when you're looking at screening, you've used the, the, the statement temperature gun. We had a discussion in Soweto about the fact that what are the ways in which we might use equipment uh, very much more, not frugally, but much more sensibly? And how do we go about this process? So in South Africa, in Johannesburg, we've used a simple screening tool at the gate, a sort of triage set, set station just inside of the facility where we've asked just three questions. And I'd like to get your sense of what are you all doing? We've said the screening questionnaire to decide is actually if you are having a cough, a fever, a sore throat and any respiratory distress in the last 14 days, that would be considered a risk of being having COVID. Or if you've had a, a, this for more than 14 days, you've had an exacerbation in the last 14 days. That's the second. And the third one is to ask if you've lost smell or taste dramatically. And that is your third screening question. So based on the sort of consensus in South Africa amongst infectious disease and other, that has become our standard question, which is asked by community health workers at the front gate. We strongly advise, because we had uh, facility managers taking the gun and the temperature gun and telling them to use it at the front gate. And we've said, no, no, please do not do that. Because that temperature gun itself, most times patients with COVID don't walk around with fever. Actually, 30, 30 40% of patients only have fever at any one time. So it's not a consistent sign. And in fact, we've turned around and said that that should be part of the clinical management. So in other words, as these COVID, potential COVID patients are screened into a, an orange area, high risk zone near the gate where they are managed literally under a tent, we've said that the clinician there needs to assess them. And we've said there are four measures to assess them uh, and then decide on management is basically we need to do a respiratory rate if they're in distress, to do a pulse oximeter, to get a pulse and an oxygen saturation. And the real, and, and the third one, in fact, is a, not, that's basically a temperature pulse and pulse, uh, the, the, ox, the, the, the respiratory rate, yeah. Those basically, you don't even need a blood pressure unless the patient warrants, in fact, that decision. So the pulse oximeter, the, the real issue is in fact the respiratory rate's deceptive because these patients can in fact have a uh, not be in severe respiratory distress, but they, their SATs, oxygen SATs can be very low. And so the pulse oximeter is a very vital piece of equipment. And you know, if you're looking at the pulse oximeter compared to the temperature gun, you can get three pulse oximeters for one temperature gun. So I would strongly advise that you'll look at that, but give me an idea of what is it that you're a screening at the front and also as clinicians going, what's going on in terms of the decision-making? Because we are now in that space are saying, you know, initially we said everyone coming into this with COVID symptoms, they're using that screening tool, would in fact get a test. But we're running into trouble. The Department of Health can't cope with the tests. And we pushed initially to have it. Now we're sitting back and saying, hang on, we're gonna have to decide on a much more sensitive marker for patient um, risk, not just the fact that they may have COVID, but in fact, before we admit them, because once they admit, they will get the COVID test, but in between, how do we pick up on a patient? So it may have to be a clinical decision that this patient appears ill 
and that you know the, the clinician can define it as either having a respiratory rate above 25 or you know, a confluence of things that says this person looks in distress or their pulse, their SATs is below 95, that we would say, let's do the test. And then we'd be sitting and saying, well, I'm not admitting them. I'm gonna say, go home, self-isolate, but this person needs a test. So we're sitting in the middle of that little quandary. It'd be interesting to see your thoughts and what y'all are doing between you and uh, you know, all three of y'all. I think that would be an interesting question if you can just reflect on that um, and just see how y'all are doing now and what you think of what I've just suggested. Um, Sam, you on, you know, you unmuted, so you can go ahead and then Ines. Yes, the mic. yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor. Now, I look at what we are doing and I feel like, hmm, this may not be very useful, especially temperature. Hmm. Because temperature could be due to anything, typhoid, malaria, and so on. So yeah. it's not a very good, it's not a very good parameter in this checklist. It is not. And now we have to, to wait from the ministry, their guidance, because up to now, it is still the temperature. So unless we wake them up or say, oh, this may not help us as clinicians or as we move on with this, because a lot of adjustment has been done along the way. Mm -hmm. A lot of things have been done along the way. First, it was at Tentebe. Now they roll it to regional referrals, and I believe this checklist, whether it be cough or fever or cough or uh, sore throat or flu or cold or uh, yes, or loss of taste or smell, that is what we should be talking about. So we can narrow okay. yeah. this and then can make sense. And we're quite you. willing yeah. to share the, you know, the kind of insights and work that has been done in South Africa. So, you know, yes. feel free yeah. if you would like. I think Innocent is certainly... We'd love yeah. to share that. So it's all available. Please take advantage of it. Correct. But we'd love to, um, to understand what you're doing as well and some of the rationale. And I, I think we all learn from each other. Maybe Correct. Innocent and then Michael, or and maybe Michael, you can respond and then Innocent last. Yeah. Michael? Yeah, that's true. Hello? Yeah, yeah yes, that's there, true. Yeah. Most of our screening has been basing on identifying those with a high temperature. But like you discussed, we notice that we, it has a low catch. Above all, yes. like I've said, the majority are symptomatic. So mm. it, the temperature gun in itself seems to be not a very useful tool. Mm. I wish to say that we also have a screening tool. Interestingly, our screening tool has the symptoms of fever, a sore throat. We haven't yet put a loss of tests there, but we can modify it. Mm -hmm. Taste and smell. Uh, and then the other thing is that we we applying that tool for the cases that were identified probably with a high temperature. I wish to add that we are also saying history of travel uh, from a high risk country. Mm -hmm. um, basically, that's what we've been using. But from the discussion here, I realize we have to change it a bit. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, when you no, talk about the four measures before we administer the test. Mm. I think that is also very revealing to us. The scenario I've observed here is that we've been very enthusiastic to front the test. But now the question is, are we using the test at the right time and with the right patient? And I think, Professor, I, wish to, I have to say that it has, you have given me some information to see it no, and no. look at what we are doing. No, and I hope you'll share with us also your learning as we go along. Innocent, you want to respond Certainly. to the, the screening as well? Um, go ahead, Innocent. Yeah, I, 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 of course, it is a, a, a true concern um, that we have, uh, this is a new disease which we have dealt with. And I think we are having very many thoughts coming in at a very much high rate. Uh, for example, I have been asking myself, we are using the temperature everywhere you refer to enter building. I know now many schools are ordering for these temperature guns. But you know, mm -hmm. I am just wondering about the utility of using a temperature gun in a high malaria yes. prevalence uh, context. Exactly. So I, I, I think um, here the, the debate that we have been having among us the head of fraternity is that we need really to reflect on our context and then whatever we are to do, 
must be really context specific. Otherwise, mm-hmm. really here people can have, as Dr. Samuel said, they can have temperature due to many things. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I think we still have to, 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 to keep collecting data, keep reflecting on what we are doing, mm-hmm. and then hopefully we, 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 we come up with the practical um, um, uh, issues to deal with. Now, I, you know, I am a cognizant of the time. I think we're supposed yes, to... Yes, I think we, we, we... Just quickly, I'll, I'll help you along. I think that uh, Isiepe has raised the issue of history giving you, you know, lots of diagnosis and temperature being mm-hmm. relatively limited. I think that mm-hmm. is true, and I think that's a point you just made now, Innocent, so we can consider that question answered. You know, it's, it's a lot of history, and I think that specific history, which is the symptoms... And I think that we struggle with cold flu. People are t- interpreting in many ways, asking yeah. about chest pain and headache. But it's actually mm-hmm. these three symptoms um, that the set symptom set must be very clear. So I think we need to, to actually be very wary of that. So I think the, the, the other one that came out in, uh, by Aisha is that um, she's very interested in the sort of um, mm-hmm. the communication of risk. I think that was mentioned by... Uh, Sam, about how do you to tell the community about what are the, you know, what about the disease and also what about the ways in which we can prevent transmission? Um, I think you all are having masks in place, hand washing and uh, physical distancing. So I think those, those have been mentioned, it seems, and I think you all, are, you all are involved in that. I think for pre-symptomatic patients and asymptomatic, uh, taking the temperature, like we've said, it's pretty much useless because they don't have any symptoms and it's not a very good strong indicator, even if you do have symptoms, that these are in fact related to uh, COVID because you can have no temperature and yet you may have COVID. I think I shall ask one more question and we can close up. And the last one I'll leave for you uh, to answer is the question of tra- truck drivers being chess. Um, point of entry as the truck drivers are checked, but the rest of the population is con- are crossing are they under the same follow-up? I think the question is, you'll have closed borders, isn't it? Have you closed yeah, borders? Yeah, we, we have borders closed borders, but, but the open to the truck drivers. <laughs> that's okay. So, so that's the closed. <laughs> <laughs> So you'll have to really follow up the truck drivers very strongly yes. then, because clearly you'll yeah, have found them you know, the way to come in. <laughs> no, the argument is that we are in a locked country, so if we don't get any surprise from elsewhere, we shall You're die. You're not going to eat. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I agree. But that becomes the question of how do you, which is the truth, how do you manage this question of truck drivers coming in? Um, and, and, I mean, do you quarantine them? Can you test them when they walk in? Or are you telling them that when they cross the border, they must have done a test, which is in the last one week? that says, I don't have COVID. These are interesting questions because that's the future for everybody. They're going to have to allow travel. So I'd be very interested if you are thinking along those lines. But let's leave that as food for thought. I think as Innocent is concerned about time. One more, <laughs> one more question, and I think, Innocent, you can, you can answer this one, and Michael and Sam. What do you all think about Madagascar's organic COVID <laughs> cure? <laughs> tell, us, tell us what you all think in your uh. <laughs> and no, Samu can start, and then we shall see. <laughs> you pass it off no to him. <laughs> no, I comment. Have no, no comment. I have no good, comment. Good no. shot, good shot, yeah. Sam. That's exactly yes. what you do. Pass the potato back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, no, but I think the, the, the question he concludes by asking why can't African scientists be given a chance? Uh, the only comment I can make is that. Um, in Africa, we have coexisted uh, with Western medicine and, um, and African medicines. Um, uh, and of course, what we know and from experience is that the, the African medicine has really high level of acceptance. The challenge is that we never know the, 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 the active ingredients. We never know any side effects. We never know the dosage. And we even don't even know the mechanism of action. It is not unusual for the same hub to be used for treating several diseases. So uh, the, the challenge would be if this, uh, uh, if this COVID organic from Madagascar has any bad effects or any other concoctions within it, that is one. But also, 
it will it may interfere with the acceptance of the other things like social distancing of people will know after all once i get the disease i will sort of the the, the covid organ so yeah. I, I i think uh, the comment would be it will be labeled and grouped like any other african remedy that you have lived with for centuries and then we see how it goes <laughs> of course I mean, people will actually, I mean, if it's a local, you know, traditional, you're going to get all sorts of try, you know, people trying things. But I think that maybe, Michael, you can end in in sense of, I think, you know, besides the fact the potential, like Innocent, you say, of traditional herbs, and I think we should all be urging our, our traditional colleagues to say, science is not anti and traditional. It is actually something that just says, show for effect, go through the processes, that same yeah. thing will land yeah. up being used. So don't wait for somebody else to do it. Do it here in Africa yourself. Take it, figure it out. And you can try, you know, randomized control trials, even though you don't know exactly what the, you know, the, the actual, you know, base uh, compound is. But if a plant is doing something, it's, you know, randomized con control trials can still work. So I think that I'm actually quite, you know, want to respond on another space to say, you know, not only have we got potential with traditional medicine, but I think there's some really great innovation starting to happen in Africa around, um, you know, software and uh, PPE and all sorts of things. And I think we must all be keeping an eye out. So perhaps in closing, Michael, are there any sort of gems of gems of innovation that you're seeing happening in um, in Uganda? Maybe we can close on that basis. Do you think a comment from each of you or Michael, whoever wants to volunteer, do, do you all have anything that you're seeing like? That's really innovative. It's coming from Uganda. Yeah, I think one, one of the things I can mention, the people are really trying to think. Um, for example, here at Makere University, the researchers in the School of Public Health have made uh, a low-cost ventilator, which I don't think anyone was thinking about because it is not quite common to have patients requiring ventilation. But when COVID came in, then the people really started thinking. And I think if the momentum can be maintained, that would be nice. The other thing really for me, which I, I would think is not a bad idea, is that there are some presidencies which have occurred, uh, and they are really very important learning points for PHC that you can leverage on. For example, the issue of equity. Uh, I mean, at least the government was able to realize that there are some vulnerable people who need affirmative action in the form of food and all of that. So I think in the future we can actually say, hey, we know that people have different requirements within our communities and we know that we should, we should respond according to the specific needs of the people. And the other thing is actually, I think, community action for health. Uh, when the president urged the people to come out and help, it was very interesting that the business people contributed the money to really deal with the COVID pandemic. I think if really one can, can, can use the same model of mobilizing communities for PHC, I, I think community participation and the community action, it, yeah. COVID has taught us that it is quite possible. But also the political will, you know, normally uh, political will is people always sing about it, but they never get to the dance floor to actually dance to it. So I think we have seen the political action. Uh, uh, I think Michael, who is in the regional referral hospital, we have seen the people trying to say, we need to build the capacity for hospitals. So every politician, even from different political parties, came together. So the political will that, has, that you have witnessed with the COVID-19 is something that we should be able to say, this is impossible. And I think we shouldn't be looking at only problems, particularly for us who are really interested in the PHC that has been neglected. They are really wrote that we can learn. Wonderful. I think that if we can translate COVID as a crisis into the opportunity yeah. of mm -hmm. strengthening primary health care under universal health coverage, sounds great. Michael, in closing, do you want to share any comments? Yeah, I think Innocent has wrapped it well. He has brought out the fact that health is now at the center. It has actually brought in so many players to start asking, what is in a regional referral hospital? What can a district hospital do? It has been a rare question in this area, but I think, we, like you say, we can turn it around and generate a very good debate, and probably we shall even come up with better 
interventions. Great, thank great. So thank you all very much. And thank you, Innocent, for leading this process and having all your colleagues. I appreciate uh, Sam and Michael for sharing us, uh, you know, the, the insights and the time. Um, I think that we'll record this. It's been broadcast as well. So we'll have a record of it. And I'm sure that our colleagues will still have a look at it and find it valuable. So thank you once again for all your time and energy to all our listeners, um, to all those who've joined us. Thank you all very much. Have a safe and good weekend. Take care. Thank now, you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye.